All right, so uh, this is Metaprogramming in Go. Uh, I'm Joel, and um, I'm VP of Engineering at a, a Boulder-based startup called Redeem. Uh, that's Redeem with uh, R-E-D-E-A-M, so a little uh, startup misspelling in the name there. Um, check us out at redeem.com or, or on LinkedIn. Okay, so a couple definitions to start out with. Uh, so meta, uh, meta is uh, something of a higher order kind, or in, in this case, we're 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 writing a pro. We're, we're going to be talking about programs whose data, uh, whose input is the data from other programs. That's heavy use of the reflection API. So um, we're not uh, using AST here. We're not rewriting source code, but we are. What we are doing is. Um, uh, rewriting, uh, rewriting data basically, and finding multiple uses for data. So Go, what is Go? Uh, garbage collected C with a really nice concurrency primitive. Okay, so just to speak to motivation, um, what originally motivated me to get started on this path was like I was tasked with writing um, multiple API surfaces um, and expressing, you know, we have internal uh, representations of our types, internal types, and we have like variants of those things that are, that are like um, uh, shown through our API surfaces. And so there's like all these different business rules on each API surface and there's like different fields or di different uh, fields that have to be shown or suppressed or changed or maybe the data types have to be altered for the, you know, for the way in which they're um, uh, shown in, you know, in the API. So uh, initially we were writing all of these transformations by hand and there was just, I found that there was just this horizontal like explosion. Like I had to move horizontally across a lot of code surface in order to get work done. And what ended up happening is creating a lot of bugs. Um, it was difficult to like be sure that, you know, to be confident about the work that I was doing. In some cases, we had some trouble even completing the work. There's just so much surface area that had to be touched. And so um, what I moved toward, you know, what, what I really wanted was for fewer developers, like literally one developer initially, the team is larger now, but uh, fewer developers to be able to produce more by touching less code, a lot less surface area. Um, it really lends itself to like nimbleness and the ability to change things more readily and also uh, just having greater confidence in the changes that you're making because 
you're changing, uh, you're interacting with data instead of code. Uh, and there's like a small number of core engines that like process the data. Um, so those things are like really heavily battle tested and um, it just, you know, it's still possible to make mistakes, of course, but uh, just a lot, uh, it just kind of like reduces the opportunity for those mistakes. Um, so yeah, as it says there, you know, basically trading human effort for CPU utilization because we're using run, you know, uh, reflection. So we're doing more at runtime than you would ordinarily do in, in, in the sort of standard Go code uh, strategy, which would be everything statically typed. Uh, so strategy here is um, data structures uh, wherever possible um, instead of statements. Um, so for instance, we sort of everything sort of proceeds from making heavy use of slices here for the most part and everything proceeds from like a slice of routes within the slice of routes you have like slices of restful exchanges which are uh, everything's declarative and so your routes dec you know your ex uh, rather your exchanges declare like okay I expect you know to receive this data type to return this data type and to um, you know for the for the response here to be I don't know, 200, 201, whatever. And we have a lot of a lot of test cases for like 400, expected 400 level responses and what we do in those cases, and stuff like that. Um, so as I said before, a, a, small, a, a handful of core engines sort of process all of these data structures, stand them up as the code that operates, you know, at our actual uh, web servers. Um, so we stand it all up with Echo in our case. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the basic strategy is recursion and reflection. It's just riffs on that theme. So composability is another benefit here. Um, like for instance, if we have uh, m multiple API surfaces, which uh, some of which will have uh, some of the same endpoints on them, um, performing some of the similar operations, but they have like different business rules. For example, they might have different authentication um, or they might have just different business rules that need to be applied in order for you to be able to successfully um, perform that interaction. So what we can do is like defer the application of middleware, um, but just by attaching that later. Uh, it's just, it's all variations on a theme of <coughs> using loops and, and looping over these data structures and like maybe erasing a middleware or replacing it or something like that uh, in, order, in order to allow like the same, you know, basic routes with their handlers to, to be used in, in different, uh, you know, two or three or four different API surfaces that have slight variations. Of, uh, in particular, what happens with us a lot is um, the application of specific business rules that either, you know, allow something to happen or not or authentication schemes are different. Okay, so there's three slides with code on it. Um, here I'm just showing uh, this like the declarative syntax here, and this this is uh, a way of expressing the the transformations that we wish to occur. So, by you know, basic strategy here is uh, just say what you want to happen, and later the the core engine will like make that happen at runtime. So, I want to like highlight the, you know, the red, the red line there is sort of highlight one aspect of, of the um, way in which this helps us, for example, to prevent drift between our actual code and the swagger uh, documentation of that code. Um, so what happens there is we say, hey, look, uh, this particular, um, this particular field, um, it has these enumerated values. And so it like reflects on the actual data and produces like we show a little uh, screen cap, a little screenshot down there of the, uh, of the enum values that are actually plucked out of the code as opposed to, um, you know, like a comment based strategy for Swagger where uh, you could very easily like not update your comments to be in sync with your code. And a lot of what's going on here is uh, sort of leveraging this this approach to force 
force the swagger that gets generated to be uh, in much tighter sync with, with the code itself. So uh, recursion with the visitor pattern. So this is just expanding on that point a little bit. Um, here, you know, we have we have uh, basically a custom bind and export that are sort of, you know, sort of uh, similar to the Marshall and non-Marshall in the standard library. And what we're doing here is just like just like standard library does, we're using reflection and um, we're reflecting on the on we're just walking recursively over the data structures and then. Uh, rip, uh, reflecting on their type and applying particular rules, transformation rules to each node based on what type it is. Um, and so what this allows us to do is, for instance, to take um, uh, something that's like, like internally uh, represented as, a, as like a complex structure and have it be a string in, 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 the, in the API surface or something like that. And one more slide. This is the last slide with code on it. Um, and so here, I just I just wanted to show an example of like here's a full expression of one particular route, and um, it has a handler on it. The the middlewares are applied uh, later, and that just depends on what surface it's like uh, being attached to. So different surfaces will have different uh, middlewares that make sense for those for those surf API surfaces. And, it, and then the red again. I wanted to highlight. Uh, one line here, which is the exchanges. These, and this, in this case, what I'm doing is these are the very same uh, tests. These are like my integration tests that I run in a, uh, via a mechanism like similar to Docker Compose, which we do locally and in CI. Um, and in that case, we actually, you know, act, you actually provide arguments, uh, non-empty string arguments. So these, this particular uh, te a test function wants four string arguments. Uh, they're, they're, just, they're just like UUIDs and stuff like that. Um, here, the values don't matter, so I just let them be empty strings because what happens is uh, um, when I'm generating uh, Swagger, for instance, I'll, I'll, just go into, I'll just go into there and just examine the data and just look for the expectations about you know, what, what, what each test is going to expect it to re uh, respond with in terms of its response code, the types of data that are input and output, and that will later feed into, into the swagger. So I'll have a slide to kind of show, to show uh, the result of all of that. So multiple use, um, those exchanges are really uh, a, a good example of that. Um, th these are the actual tests that we test the operating code uh, with. Uh, so in order to prepare for merge and just have that confidence, we write a lot of tests. Um, we run them in CI. Uh, we used a second time in uh, another program, which you know, uh, which um, uh, has has these routes as its input, and it just generates swagger by, through reflection and recursion. And then they used a third time in this uh, uh, another integration testing tool we have, which we call our end-to-end -end runner. And what that does is, you know, after you actually uh, merge and deploy code to, uh, we use Kubernetes, so you merge and deploy code. Uh, to a particular environment, and all, all of your uh, services are stood up, and then you run this end-to-end -end runner, and you actually just, again, using these, these same exchanges, now you're out uh, at the deployed code, and you're just walking over the API surfaces and just asserting that, you know, you're getting the responses and you're getting, you know, the, the detailed content of the response bodies is what you, what you assert or what you expected it to be. Um, and we can optionally, you know, employ an argument in this end-to-end -end runner, uh, which says uh, uh, produce a, a Postman collection file. Uh, so this that, that last bit is actually pretty useful for our, our actual customers uh, because what we do is we like, uh, you know, generate API keys for them, and then uh, we produce these, you know, hundreds and hundreds of these um, uh, uh, these Postman collection files with hundreds of exchanges, uh, which we do as them. And then we sort of hand that to them when we're onboarding and just gives them a boost, something to start with, and you know, shows them how we, we were able to do, perform various operations, including the ways in which you know, user errors can happen and all the kinds of 400 level responses that can happen that, uh, you know, with their user. So here's a screenshot of our swaggers, just ordinary swagger. 
Um, but what's kind of interesting is if you look down in the lower right there, the response samples are precisely the the tested uh, the tested um, and it, uh, the expected uh, responses for particular types of requests. So that ties directly to our tests. It comes from our tests. Uh, the JSON uh, sort of example object there is uh, we just use uh, reflection and recursion to walk over the type uh, of the type of object, which is uh, in this case it's a request, uh, but likewise for the response, and we just walk over the object and produce like standard representations of the various types. Like so, for instance, you see like some of those things are UUIDs, and that's a you know a Swagger in Swagger that's a string with a UUID format. And that's expressed in uh, you know struct tags. We have custom struct tags for that. And the uh, the uh, the generator looks at it, says, okay, the struct tag here is string with format UUID. So I'm going to take this fixture. You see, all four of them are the same. I'm going to take this fixture and just put that there so that it's like uh, representative of what what the, the real data that that should be there. And I have a lot of those that are not expanded. They wouldn't fit. Um, but there's a lot of other various data types that where that hap similar thing happens. So um, I've highlighted like the benefits early on. I was talking about the way in which sort of one developer can do a lot by just touching a very you know you can just basically make a very small uh, change uh, in the code and have, and then generate things and have that expand outward into a lot of a uh, lot of change that you wanted. And you can do that with greater confidence, and that's great. But uh, I just want to kind of, you know, in full disclosure, it's not all upside. Uh, there are trade-offs here. Uh, so, you know, there's a performance hit because we're doing reflection at runtime. Uh, the binaries are larger because you need to be able to do that reflection, um, and you get limited help from the Go compiler. So that's really one of the more interesting things here. Like, I've worked a lot with languages like JavaScript, Ruby, and Perl, and like Python and where you have, you know, it's really up to you to pay very close attention to what's happening. The compiler doesn't help you there, there you know. So it's, it's sort of, you sort of put into that world a little bit, so that's, it's not all upside, um, but what I'm finding is, you know, even with, uh, even with this reflection happening, still usually around one-tenth of one percent of the CPU, so a lot of, you know, the work we do is I.O. bound, and it, it's, you know, even though it's not, even though it is slowing things down slightly, we're not really feeling uh, any impact uh, there. All right. And I see my graphic is not showing up on that one. Uh, questions? So, my question is, when the runtime is doing the reflection for you, does it do it once per class and then hold on to it? Or is it something that has to get recomputed over and over and over again at the, at the same request and it's run a bunch of times? Let's say someone just write no. Yeah, it's not like memoized or anything. It's it's not. I, I, I think if that's your question, Matt. It's just every time it runs, it runs through its routine. That's right. Um, I think I skipped over one slide. Let me go back. Yeah, yeah. So versions. So if it, you know, this is you know, I don't have any time to write version two of this thing. That's not. Realistic, but I just want to like let's just say, uh, knowing what I know now, if I were to like start over, um, probably what I would do is uh, I would like use code generation, and I actually you know early on. So I've been writing Go, you guys, for almost a year, and in my first week uh, at uh, Redeem, where you know I started writing Go, I. First thing I did is write a collection uh, API using text template and code generation because, as everyone knows, Go doesn't have generics. And I come from writing TypeScript and Scala and C Sharp, and I wanted generics. <laughs> like everybody, I want generics. So uh, I did a lot of stuff with text template, and that was an interesting experiment. And the collection API is kind of interesting. But overall, I found the developer experience to be really lacking. I really don't like writing my code as a string. And so I would actually need to find a better way to kind of do that. But like the dream is to have like a good developer experience where you're doing code generation and you just create this kind of macro language that basically does all this stuff once. 
and it produces statically typed Go as its output. And then now that's what runs, that's what stands up in your, in your cluster and runs at, you know, uh, in your services. That, that, that's really the ideal case, but uh, I found the developer experience to be very lacking, and uh, I didn't know everything that I know now when I got started on this whole system. And it, we're very invested in it now, by the way. It's like running a lot of stuff. that has a lot of features, and it's like, oh, whoops. <laughs> So, sorry, I skipped that slide, but uh, there's, there's the image. Uh, any, any other questions? I have a question. There was, there was a slide where you showed how you apply an array of transformers in a certain pipeline, um, and you're appending errors. So how do, you, how do you guys usually handle that case? Like, if there's an error, do you throw away the whole thing? Or do you try to handle the case where there's one error out of maybe four different things? Is that, is that the right? Yeah, I, I think I know what you're asking. So, uh, for the for the um, for the recording, uh, the question is about um, we're gathering, we're basically appending onto an error slice as we're like looping, as basically as we're walking over the data structure and you know trying to apply transformations to each uh, node. And what can happen is you know the expected input uh, can be wrong, or there's gonna be all kinds of things that go wrong there. And so we, we just append the errors. And the reason why we're appending errors is because we want to be able to show the user. So, so it's full on failure. It's full on fail failure. But instead of just failing at you know, capturing the first error and showing that and then, and then showing failure, uh, we show them all the ways in which it failed so that in the hope that they can like fix them all in one, you know, like see, oh, there's four things that were wrong here fix them all, and then sub resubmit the request, rather than having to do, go through that four times to figure out that, you know, the, it turns out their initial payload had four errors in it, right? So it's really just a way of assisting the end user. Okay, so the transformations don't have any dependencies between each other? No, it's not like that. It's every node is, um, you know, uh, it's completely um, separate. Yeah. It's really just a way of like, you know, you ever have that experience where you're, I don't know, running a test tool, whatever you're doing, and it just shows you the first error and stops. It's like, oh, but it turns out there's like 10 more errors, if, if only it would have gone all the way through. And I wanna see them all in one shot. So th that's just a preference. Um, and we're, hope hopefully, that's a service to the end user. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah, so we actually, we recommend to all of our, all of our API customers, we recommend go, go uh, Swagger Code Gen in particular, which is a Java program, and, and uh, most of them are, turns out, are using C Sharp, but uh, go, go Swagger, you know, if you actually try to generate Go from that program, it uses Go Swagger. So the input there is the Swagger JSON, but these tools, what they do is they take our Go source code and produce that Swagger JSON. That Swagger JSON is then you know it's then stood up as a web page. We saw a screenshot of that. We also just hand it hand it to uh, our end uh, you know our customers. Actually, there's a button to click it from the click to download it from the web page, and then from there they can generate they can generate you know clients in numerous languages. So we're starting from ultimately we're starting from Protobuf and 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 some Go. You know, and then we're producing Swagger JSON, and then then our then our clients produce their the, our API clients produce their client code, including in Go sometimes, but usually in other languages from that Swagger JSON. Right. I was just curious if you know, the other going other direction, like have your code generated from the end, and then add it. Yeah, the reverse direction, starting from the JSON and generating Go. Yeah. Um, that is potentially possible, but the thing is, is we have internal representations of our types, and then we have various um, 
very, we have a numerous variants of um, API representations of those types. And so there's a lot going on in like gRPC serv services that are underneath the surface. Um, so I hear what you're saying and we are aware of that, but I'm not exactly sure if that would map onto like our entire system. <laughs> Yeah, uh, really a lot, what, a lot of what it is is our, our, our internal representations come from protobuf. So that's kind of like our ultimate starting point. We generate code from there and then we have some additional Go code that kind of all pairs up together uh, to form the solution and, and then this stuff here is like at the API service layer. Um, so this is just a means of like taking me those many gRPC microservices and all that stuff that's going on there and like making API, you know, gateways, you know, surfaces out of out of that. Um, but yes, that that's potentially that could be done. It would just depend on basically your internal infrastructure, like, yeah. So one of the use cases you mentioned at the beginning is returning, you know, you know a subset of the or an extreme is a different type depending on, let's say, the privileges of the user who's requested. Um, yeah, that's presumably going to be based on some kind of authorization, editor, or whatever you want to um, Now, if you're going to have different protos for those different, for those different types, uh, so you know, like you've got a user with low privilege and they're going to get a um, response that has a different proto buffer, a different proto that you use for micro Do you have these swaggers uh, conditioned on those? Uh, Privileges also, or the swaggers? How, how are you kind of responding to the swagger request, which might be very different types depending on the uh, privilege level of the request? Um, it's well, uh, we actually only have one okay. internal representation, one internal type. So, uh, um, what the, the route we've taken is that we have one internal type. And, and then that type is expressed in multiple ways on multiple API services. Oh, okay. So, so this, this system, what it does is it allows you to, base, basically, Matt, what it does is it lets you declare the diff. The way, the way in which you would wish it to differ from that, that primary internal representation. And so uh, one of the big motivating things in the early, early on was like, you know, early on what, what I found myself doing was, this was, this was our, sort of first paradigm, you know, was, you know, transform by hand <coughs> this entire object this way, and now this way, and now that way, and now that way, and all that, that's what I meant by that horizontal spread. You know, and then like, you would be like, oh, actually I'm adding, I'm adding a node here, to this thing, so now I've got to do it in all these places, what if I forget it here? And there's a lot of nil point exceptions that would happen, it's very error prone. So, I mean, potentially what we could have done is, have different proto for each of those, but I wonder if that would just go the same, that would be the same problem, just a slight variant of the same problem, actually. So basically, bottom line, this lets me express the diff. Uh, so some, oftentimes you just want to like hide three fields, or like change a couple things, you know, you know what I mean? And the, the diff is much smaller, the, the similarity is much larger than the diff. I guess I haven't used the word diff at all. No, I just mean the, the difference, sorry, the difference uh, between uh, the internal representation and A, B, C, D, E, whatever so surface so representation. Yeah, I'm just saying like, sorry, just using that as a shorthand, the difference there, uh, you know, like for instance, on surface A, we want all the fields, on surface B, we want all of them except two. So the whole difference is erase those two fields. So the entire expression is like three lines of code. And that would replace what had been hundreds or whatever. This is just a way of writing less. Uh, uh, can you give an example of when it was easy to touch code without worrying about stepping on other code? Is there a practice that helps with that? Other code. Uh, I guess I'm not quite sure what 
what the question is. Yeah. Uh, Stepping on another code. Yeah, this is a kind of this thing. Stepping on other code. Well, I, I, I'm not sh exactly sure how to answer that question, I'll be honest. But I guess one, maybe, maybe this is like an answer is uh, <clears throat> since, since there is only one expression of, of everything, like in other words, we have one uh, convert, you know, a, a, a slice of convertible elements wherein we express the differences for A, B, C, D, and E, you know, surfaces uh, from differences from our internal representation, I mean. Um, there's really, I mean, it kind of, there kind of isn't other code, so maybe, maybe it, maybe that's an answer. I don't know how, how else to answer that question. I just wanted to show our last slide to you guys. Redeem is hiring.